Hello, my name is Otaviano Canuto, and I'm a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. This is the 11th of a series of short videos dealing with subjects covered in my recent book, Climbing a High Ladder Development in the Global Economy. We will now be moving from the global setting approached in the first 10 videos to country-specific determinants of economic growth. That is to say, what it takes for a country to climb the income ladder. Today, we approach the middle-income trap. The middle-income trap has become a broad designation trying to capture the many cases of developing countries that succeeded in evolving from low to middle levels of per capita income, but then appear to stall, losing momentum along the route toward the higher income levels of advanced economies. There are two ways to define the middle income trap. One is in absolute terms. That is to say, as uh, productivity and growth slow down, impeding hitherto fast growing economies, to graduate into the ranks of high income countries. Since the 1950s, rapid growth has allowed a significant number of countries to reach middle income status. Yet, very few have made the additional leap needed to become high income countries. Rather, many developing countries have become caught behind by a sharp deceleration in growth and in the pace of productivity increases. This chart depicts several countries in Asia and Latin America as staying in a narrow income band along the period from 1960 to 2014. The question then becomes whether middle income countries are more likely than others to experience a growth slowdown or whether they face a greater frequency of slowdowns than either advanced or low income countries. A middle income trap may well characterize the experience of most of Latin America since the 80s. And uh, naturally, in recent years, middle income countries elsewhere have expressed fears of following a similar path. Underlying those views is a more general feeling that moving up the income ladder gets harder the higher one climbs. The concept of middle income trap was first used in 2007 in a report by two former colleagues of mine at the World Bank, Intermed Gill and Homi Karas. They referred to the need of policy and institutional change for a country to keep climbing the income ladder after a transition from low levels. Traps are seen as shortcomings resulting from the absence of any of those policy and institutional change is considered key to gearing up the transition from middle to upper income levels. But the, uh, the middle income trap can also be defined in relative terms uh, as a lack of convergence to some benchmark high income country. This chart displays the stagnation in relative terms of most of Latin America and the Caribbean as well as of some middle-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa, using the US per capita GDP as a benchmark. Uh, see, look, uh, uh, comparing the, the relative position of uh, countries in both regions, in 1990 vis-a-vis -vis 2018, you can see the decline, the relative decline of Venezuela. Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico are reasonably uh, well, Brazil and Mexico have slightly improved their relative position, uh, whereas Argentina uh, looks stuck. Uh, Chile, Trinidad, Tobago, Panama, and Uruguay showed higher relative convergence, and they have come even to be classified as high income in the absolute concept that we saw. But in all of them, some distance still remains after three decades. Let's give a look at the uh, other, the case, the picture in other regions. Uh, for instance, you can see in the case of Southern Asia, 
uh, a picture of uh, relative convergence. Uh, and whereas in the case of Middle East and North Africa, MENA, the picture is more mixed with some case of decline and uh, combined uh, while at the same time, some others have showed some relative improvement. But uh, where the picture is uh, looks brighter in terms of relative conversions is in Eastern Asia and, and Eastern Europe and Central Asia, as you can see. Uh, but the overall point uh, that I would like to make is that despite higher growth on the non-advanced or non-rich developing side of the global economy, as we approached in the videos on trade globalization and income inequality. For many countries, the increase of per capita GDP has not been enough to either to move them up in absolute terms or to converge to advanced economies per capita income. China, which was also a subject of a, a particular video, is a case of point. The question then becomes whether middle-income countries are more likely to experience a slowdown of their catching up with upper income countries than it is the case at lower stages of the income ladder. It's not a matter of destiny, of some trap waiting there uh, for middle income countries. And we need to assess economies as individual cases. In the literature, uh, there is a gap between, on the one hand, the classic poverty trap arguments used as reference regarding the difficulties to deport from low income levels, and on the other, analysis of growth that are mainly applicable to frontier advanced countries. We need to look at middle income countries as a peculiar stage of development. Before that, we have to give a look at what determines the levels of income of a country. And in that regard, uh, we must take into account the following. Income per capita, uh, given the, 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 uh, the demographic structure of, uh, of the economy, depends on the output per worker. And the output per worker depends on uh, on the one side, on the volume, on the levels of factors of production uh, used uh, by each worker, that is to say the stocks of uh, human capital of skills accumulated by workers. Also, the stocks of physical capital, produced capital uh, available uh, to used by, by each worker, by physical capital, uh, as the name says, I'm talking about equipments, machines, uh, buildings, infrastructure, everything physical that is used by, by workers, and also natural wealth. Natural wealth will be the subject of our next video in this series. But the point here to make is that the flow of output per worker from which uh, the income uh, of uh, per capita income of a country is a direct consequence depends on the stocks of uh, factors of production utilized by each worker, but also the relationship between that, the employment and factors of production per worker and the output per worker depends obviously on the levels of productivity in the use of those factors. And productivity in a nutshell depends on the state of technology, on the technology embedded in the, in, in the production of, of the country, as well as the efficiency, uh, the way by which the resource, the factors of production and, and, and the workers are allocated in that economy. Uh, and this can be illustrated exactly in this chart by this relationship between on the one hand, increases in the factors of production per worker and correspondingly increases in the output per worker at a diminishing rate because uh, you cannot simply expect the output per worker to increase linearly with the factor of production per worker. Now, this relationship uh, depends obviously on the level of technology and efficiency as expressed in so-called production function here. And 
difference in output per worker uh, between countries can be traced exactly to difference either in factor accumulation, as you can see in this case, along the same production function in two countries, country one having a higher output per worker because of higher levels of uh, factors of production accumulation, right, per worker, or the difference can be due to different to productivity. When you have two countries here with the same levels of factor of production per worker, but that exhibit different outputs uh, per worker because of difference in the production function, in technology or efficiency. And obviously you can have both uh, differences in factor accumulation and in productivity to explain the difference between two countries. And indeed, uh, one may map uh, such a difference uh, among countries in, uh, in uh, with the countries here classified in, as by income groups, poor is 20%, second poor is 20%, middle, second richest and richest. And as you can see, uh, this is relative to the US, the richest 20% uh, uh, countries, they have levels of factor production per worker quite close to the ones of the United States as well as when it, in the case of productivity, whereas those corresponding levels diminish uh, as poor a country is, right? This is, uh, which allows us to understand that we need to think of the middle income countries as uh, cases of uh, midterm of both accumulation and innovation. So middle income country growth involves putting in place the mechanism for increasing investment in both physical and human capital, that is to say accumulation, as well as using the natural wealth in an appropriate way, but also creating the incentives for innovation. And for that matter, uh, the middle income country needs to have the institutions uh, affecting timely transitions from accumulation to innovation. That is to say, uh, the middle income country cannot end up being stuck with structures that they don't have much use for anymore. Uh, so we need to approach middle income countries as being in a complex transition play phase between accumulation and innovation based economies. And that's why we, need to look at middle-income countries as a specific stage of growth and development. Look, in most cases of successful evolution from low to middle income per capita in recent history, the underlying development process has been broadly similar. Typically, there is a large pool of unskilled labor that is transferred from subsistence level occupations to more modern manufacturing or service activities that do not require much skill upgrade from those workers, but nonetheless employ higher levels of capital and of embedded technology. The associated technology is available for richer countries and easy to adapt to local circumstances. The gross effect of such a transfer, usually happening in tandem with urbanization, is a substantial increase in total factor productivity. That is to say, an expansion of the value of GDP, of the gross domestic product, that goes beyond what can be explained by the expansion of labor capital and other physical factors of production to the economy. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the transfer of, uh, of people from the pool of, uh, of unskilled labor uh, constitutes uh, sort of uh, low hanging fruits. But reaping the gains from such low hanging fruits in terms of growth opportunities, sooner or later face limits after which growth may slow down and the economy may get trapped in middle income levels. The turning point in this transition 
occurs either when the pool of transferable unskilled labor is exhausted, or in some case, when the expansion of labor absorbing modern activities peaks before that exhaustion happens. Well, beyond this point of exhaustion or peak of the transfer, raising total factor productivity and maintaining a fast growth pace becomes dependent on the economy's domestic ability to move upward in manufacturing service or agricultural value chains toward activities characterized by technological sophistication, as well as high requirements in terms of human capital and intangible assets, such as design and organizational capabilities. The path from low to middle income and then to high income corresponds to increasing the shares of population moved from subsistence activities to simple modern tasks and then to sophisticated ones. Within sector productivity gains and moving up value chains, rising weight relative to productivity lifting cross sector structural change. And obviously in uh, an institutional appropriate supporting uh, setting of uh, innovations and complex chains of market transactions is of the essence. Instead of mastering existing standardized technologies, the challenge becomes the local creation of domestic capabilities and institutions, which cannot be simply brought or copied from abroad. Provision of education to labor and of appropriate infrastructure becomes a minimum condition. The current middle income countries in Latin America decelerated their labor transfer process from subsistence before exhausting labor surpluses as macroeconomic mismanagement and inward orientation until the 90s established early limits to that process. Nevertheless, some enclaves up on the ladder of value chains have been established. Uh, for instance, the technology intensive agriculture and sophisticated capabilities of deep sea oil drilling, as well as aircraft design in Brazil. So it's worth remarking that, particularly in the case of large economies, heterogeneity and diversity of states is to be expected. Brazil's per capita income, classified as upper middle by the World Bank, is associated with an economic structure where one locates both high and low income types of activities and jobs. Overcoming middle income traps in such a case means upgrading a substantial share of overall employment, including by rescuing low income agents left behind as such by the previous transition. By contrast, Asian fast growth economies have relied extensively on international trade to scale up their labor transfer through insertion into the unskilled labor intensive segments of global value chains, as we have approached before. This has been facilitated by advances in information and communication technologies combined with decreasing transport costs and lower international trade barriers. Taken together, those factors made possible the unbundling of production lines and chains of tasks with different degrees of sophistication requirements that can be geographically dispersed. Uh, later in the series, we will uh, uh, make a video uh, comparing two contrasting experience in that regard of Brazil and South Korea. Now, let me show you uh, exactly the typical path uh, followed by uh, uh, a, a country that is expected to cross on the way up the ladder. So this chart shows the structure of wealth uh, for economies by income group. It, it is, uh, it displays average and obviously individual countries will differ for instance, because of different levels of natural wealth. However, 
three broad features may be highlighted. One, the high and increasing weight of human capital. Two, the weight of produced capital, the physical capital, stabilized in relative terms after the ascent from low income levels. And third, regardless of country specific natural resource richness, its weight decreased relatively along the ascent. Although not included in the data displayed in the chart, one may expect a strong correlation between the human capital accumulation and local development of intangible assets as we approach in our video on globalization and technological learning. Which uh, intangible assets were those? Capabilities to adapt to technologies and innovate, managerial and organizational capabilities, rules and institutions that do not impose costs and waste on chains of transactions, which tend to become dense and complex as the economy climbs the ladder. One may expect the return from these intangible assets to underlie what Moses Abramovitz called our measured ignorance. Namely, total factor productivity increase is not explained by the accumulation of production factors in exercise of GDP and productivity decomposition based on production functions. So, Local development of capabilities of imitation and creative adaptation of existing technologies, followed by or in tandem with capabilities to innovate, is a requisite to raise productivity, upgrade occupation, and move up the income ladder. Recalling what we remarked in our video on technological learning, any application of technology needs locally specific content that cannot be acquired or transferred by means of textbooks or other codifiable forms of knowledge transmission. This knowledge cannot be made explicit. It is not simply transmissible in blueprints and thus cannot be perfectly diffused as either public information or private property. It must be developed locally. So production technology adoption and invention requires a relatively high level of such idiosyncratic knowledge and local capabilities. Therefore, Local investment in intangible assets, adding them to the stock of factors of production per worker is of the essence on the way up the ladder. Well, which allows us to uh, establish the following needs of policy and institutional adaptation for a country to go beyond the, the, uh, the, the middle income trap the potential middle income trap. Traps may take place in situations when upgrading face high obstacles to gain competitiveness because of incumbents in global markets. Gil and Karas uh, in 2007 used middle income trap to designate economies that were being squeezed between the low wage poor country competitors that dominate in mature industries and the rich country innovators that dominate in industries undergoing rapid technological change. To a large extent, manufacturing in Latin America was relatively squeezed by the large addition of cheaper labor to the global economy, resulting from the downfall of the Soviet Union and China's economic integration as we approach. Ultimately, however, one may point to local insufficiency or uh, lack of uh, appropriateness of some of the policies and institutions necessary to underpin the transition upward as potential causes of middle income traps. And so let's check this summary of uh, the morphing set of policy priorities if an economy is to move beyond the track from low to middle income stage. First, as economies evolve from low to middle income, so do their growth drivers. While accumulating physical produced capital remains important for growth in middle income economies, human capital accumulation and total factor productivity improvement 
or growth in production not derived from higher use of inputs acquire larger weight in growth determination. Productivity-centered growth is needed to reach high income, but also innovation becomes increasingly important. Uh, as it matters more as economies approach the technological frontier and entrepreneurship turns new ideas or technology into innovation-based growth. Opportunity-driven entrepreneurship, which is often built on new ideas or technology, increasingly outweighs necessity-driven entrepreneurship, which responds to existing market needs. And then uh, uh, the nature of government policies must also uh, change. The uh, risk-taking entrepreneurs take the lead uh, in fostering innovation, and these individuals respond to incentives that are either strengthened or weakened by economic policies and institutions. Governments can promote innovative entrepreneurship through stronger intellectual property protection and rule of law, as well as by better access to finance and allowing private sector competition to prevail. Well, graduation to high income also requires uh, a more diverse and more sophisticated product mix. So in addition to producing a wider range of goods, middle income economies must aim to produce more complex goods and service, which support higher productivity and better wage. And human capital accumulation rise in relevance as we saw in the, uh, in the previous charts, and therefore, the emphasis must be on ramping up the quality of education. Economies with relatively high cognitive skills benefit from having a critical mass of students likely to become innovators. As economies move closer to the technological frontier, the returns on research-oriented innovation increase. But also uh, consistent with uh, all that we are saying, infrastructure, the quality of infrastructure also uh, matters. And uh, the infrastructure needs shift as an economy becomes more complex and sophisticated. So, uh, and there is a nexus between advanced infrastructure, highly developed skills and innovation. Uh, the role of the government necessarily evolves as an economy progresses becoming more of a supportive type as the private sector is fully fleshed. The government must shape an environment conducive to innovative entrepreneurship by promoting investment in education and infrastructure. The point to highlight here is the shifting uh, role of government, uh, becoming more supportive of development uh, of the private sector uh, in this uh, new stage. But obviously, uh, an environment conducive to growth needs macroeconomic stability. Uh, because when a country reaches middle income levels, its growth rate tends to become more vulnerable to indicators affecting macroeconomic stability. Now, uh, there are the so-called hysteresis effects, the path dependence negative uh, after, after banking and the currency crisis. Uh, and also the exposure to capital inflow fluctuations, uh, uh, as well as the legacy of macroeconomic instability. Instability, it affects the risk premiums in the minds of, uh, of, uh, of investors. And uh, so macroeconomic instability uh, tends to affect negatively the investment ratios in a, in, a, in a country, particularly as it reached the middle income level. Now, the point that we try to highlight is the qualitatively distinctive nature of the middle income stage of development, differentiated from both high and low income phases, demanding 
uh, an effort to go beyond generalizations about growth and productivity. In our view, the relevance of the concept of middle income traps stems not from being a hypothesis about deterministic trends in growth, but rather as a warning shot against complacency risks of casting forward past transition successes instead of updating policies and institutions to new requirements. Individual middle income country experiences of falling into a trap may be approached as cases of lack of or fading performance in footing the bill in terms of appropriate policies and institutions. You will find a discussion on the middle income trap in chapter 16 of my book that you can find on those places on the slide. In the next video, we will approach natural wealth, one of the potential factors of production, the stocks of which help determine the output per worker. We will discuss then what make natural wealth either a blessing or a curse. Stay tuned. <laughs>